Okay, uh, thank you all for coming. I really appreciate seeing you all here. Welcome to the finals of the 2019 HWS Round Robin. Uh, as, as most of you have already heard, this, this event means an awful lot to me, and I think it means a lot to the community, and we're very proud to host it here at HWS uh, without much uh, further uh, announcements or ceremony. I will introduce the teams on opening government. We have a team from Harvard University. <laughs> on opening opposition, we have a team from the University of Oxford. Is that the right one? Closing government, we have another team from Harvard University. And on closing opposition, we have a team from Melbourne. Um, the uh, motion, which I don't have word for word in front of me, <laughs> is that uh, this house would. I'm not going to remember. I'm not going to remember anything. Uh, okay. This house believes that the Black Lives Matter movement should embrace open carry gun laws and engage in armed community patrols. So that's it. that looks like it'll be an interesting topic to hear something about. And so, without further ado, let's start the round. I would ask the speakers, um, since we don't unfortunately have microphones for POIs, just make sure you project to get the audio. impartially, fairly, and efficaciously. We say, with African Americans, that this compact has broken down. In a place where the state has produced such a dysfunctional relationship, where they cannot be trusted themselves not to impose violence, and where that community strain has meant that they cannot effectively police other crimes in that neighborhood, we need a solution. To that end, we propose a simple model. We think that the Black Lives Matter movement should train people to wear uniforms and form a community watch few parts of that training. One, we think they're going to be trained in gun safety things. We'll happen to take people with law enforcement, military backgrounds, and make sure that they know how to safely operate this, these firearms. There'll be very high strictures for who we vet it. Then we're going to train them in mediation, de-escalation de techniques, the techniques that modern police departments use, except for the United States. And lastly, we're going to have them do things like wear a uniform wall-opening carabine. You will know that this is someone who is trained, someone from a reputable community watch organization who know who they are and are easily identifiable by police and members of the community. To that end, what we want them to do are two primary obligations. First, monitor police community uh, relations. When the police are arresting someone, we think they will likely be nearby already through social media or through uh, like scanning police radars. We think they should go to the scene of the crime and monitor that police community interaction. The second thing they should do is police other crimes, stopping active crimes and reporting those to the police. We do not envision this as vigilante justice or a justice system, just making sure if you see a crime, you would go in and stop it like all community watch programs. We think this has two incredibly important consequences. Oh, okay. Yes. Um, what accountability mechanism would be in place for this quasi police force? Would um, we'll be fired and criminally prosecuted if you mess up? Okay. <laughs> so, our first argument is how this makes gun reform more likely and how this is in line with Black Lives Matter's objectives. First thing to keep in mind is that many gun reform laws in the United States are genuinely controversial. It's generally held, a widely held view that people want semi-automatic weapons. But there are many other things that are low-hanging fruit, things that are not very controversial, that would save millions of lives if enacted. 
We think that this action by Black Lives Matter makes that political reform of the low-hanging fruit of gun reform much more likely. Why do you think that is? Because while things like background checks and stopping straw sales are very popular amongst people, there is an NRA block and a political lobby block by highly motivated gun rights activists that stops that from happening uniquely in this country. We think that when the political valence of gun rights changes from being something that they can be portrayed in racial terms, in ethnic terms, to something that would, just like we saw in California, be portrayed as scary black people carrying guns, a lot of the people who would have absolute no restrictions on guns whatsoever will change their political valence. Why do we think this is likely to be true? Philando Castile, for the simple crime of telling a police officer he had a gun in his car, was gunned down by the police. In response to that, it took the NRA over three days to release one newsletter without publicizing it all, without running ads. We say in the modern area, police reform and police violence has become racialized to the extent that many of these issues come around in party lines. That's why the NRA is one of the top voters for Trump and often says things in line with the idea that Black Lives Matter is wrong on the issue of police violence. Implicitly in people's mind, why you want guns is for protection. And for many people, those, that protection comes in a racialized form of protecting them against black people. If they think that crime and black people and the things they associate with these fears for why they want those guns are actually what is empowered by having lax gun laws in America, we well, think we're more likely to get those background checks. This looks like Megyn Kelly seeing a Black Panther walking around a polling site and calling it intimidation on Fox News. This looks like Trump tweeting out loud that there shouldn't be, why do these people get this gun? This looks like a sketchy person. And the NRA, then because the rest of their coalition looks at this and says, why this is something I'm uncomfortable and scared of, then is forced and changes their position. Just like Trump coming out against a bump just like Trump coming for a bump stock ban, change the NRA's position on bump stocks because the other members of their coalition will. We think the fervent gun rights activists, when they see the other members of their political coalition, predominantly the president and other conservative voters, will change their position, just like they did in California. At that time, California was one of the most conservative states because it was racializing, it was becoming ethnically diverse very fast, and we saw in California, even one of the more conservative states at the time, this very strong effect. Wait, I'll take one. Yeah, so the NRA argues that you don't want the bad guys having the guns, you need guns to defend yourself. So surely the consequence of your policy is they make gun laws more lax. You have a gun to defend yourself from the person with the yes. gun that is threatening on your side. This goes to the distinction I made at the top of my piece between there being people who genuinely want guns, but there also being low-hanging fruit in gun reform. What are the things I'm talking about? The things I'm talking about aren't no one should have a gun, they're good citizens should have guns. That's why we should stop straw scales and background checks. So what the NRA will say is, yeah, you're a good person, you'll pack us a background check, you deserve to have a gun, you're right, but scary black people, or people who you don't know where they're from, or other people, shouldn't have a gun. That distinction means that we're more likely not, we're never going to ban guns in this country. We think we're more likely to have restrictions on the type of person who can have guns if you present the type of person who can have a gun as someone that is scary to the NRA's political coalition. Our second argument, oh, really quick, why does Black Lives Matter care about this? One, blacks are hurt by far the most by gun violence in the United States. Suicide, de accidental deaths, criminal violence all predominantly affect them, killing literally thousands of people a year. As a movement dedicated to the preservation of black life, we care about them inherently. Set third, secondly, Black Lives Matter is inherently committed to other political aims of the left. That's why they care about Palestinian liberation. This is a major concern of the left. Third, in a world where the police are less afraid of an armed citizenry, there's less police violence. If the police know when they go up to a car, that person is less likely to have a gun. They're less likely to pull out a gun themselves. Our second argument concerns how this decreases political vi uh, police violence. First, direct action. What happens on our side of the house? Instead of a, a lone black team being there with the police with no idea that they can be protected, where there's an increasingly confrontational attitude, and when they think the police could kill them and they need to constantly break out or try to run away, we think that is much less likely to happen if someone trained by Black Lives Matter is there to mediate the dispute. If someone there shows up with a gun themselves and says, I will protect both sides, I'm mediating this, I'm trying to calm it down, we think we're much less likely to get the sort of like frictioned interactions that often escalate into police violence. Very few people go out thinking they're gonna shoot someone, and that obviously police officers don't wanna commit violence against citizens. We think in an area where you have fear and tension about what's going on, and there's an asymmetry of power between someone who thinks they could kill me, if all of a sudden they know someone on their side is impartially mediating them who also has a gun, it decreases the efficacy of that. But also we think this makes it much more politically viable for there to be reforms on that. Michelle will get to that in his speech. I'm very, very proud.
we thank that speaker very much for those remarks, and this now, House is now very happy to welcome the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Pat. The fight against institutionalized racism cannot succeed through the politics of force when the subjugation of the black body is exp expressed through institutional asymmetries of power. African Americans must fight through the courts and through the streets because change can only occur when people of color go high and when oppressors go low. And that is the stance that Kit and I stand by. We support a world in which Black Lives Matter explicitly supports anti-gun legislation for the same reasons that opening government identifies that is so harmful for African American communities that primarily uses peaceful metrics and we're even happy with community patrols that don't choose to use guns as a mechanism by which they do these patrols but rather trying to mediate normally and take account of what the police is doing. What we oppose on the government side is the use of guns in particular and the unique ways in which this is going to play out in American politics and how this is going to massively damage the relationships between Black Lives Matter and conventional traditional politicians and mainstream Democrats and Republicans. So, I'm going to do two different things for you. First of all, I'm going to briefly characterize what we think this world is likely to look like and the kinds of scenarios in which this is going to play out. Then I'm going to move into three different claims. I'm going to explain, first of all, why this is going to lead to the over-militarization of the police in a further and more pernicious way. Second of all, why this will lead to targeting specifically of BLM and why that doesn't mean that you get explicit gun control, but rather focused attacks on BLM as an organization. And finally, I want to talk about the increases in the ability to get legislation against gun violence on our side of the house. So, claim number one. What is likely to happen? I think it's important to note here that this is a remarkably large grassroots organization. So despite all the training that we hear from the opening government team, I think it's just very likely that there's going to be an accident or a mistake at some point. A part in which you might believe that a police officer is going to attack an African American, for instance, and that you'll fight back or shoot back in retaliation. These are all things that are extremely likely to be caught on videotape given the relative prominence of videotaping, etc., in the modern era in comparison to the time of the Black Panthers. I think it's important to know that this is going to be massively politically damaging, that'll be played on every single Fox News station, and it's going to be shown around America. But the second thing is, even if this doesn't happen, or even if this doesn't happen regularly, in general, this is going to create a massive paranoia that exists within American politics and within police forces to believe that there is always an ongoing threat that might be posed by BLM. So, why is that so harmful? First, because this is going to lead to the militarization of the police. I think it's important to note here that the likely consequence of this policy is that you get more arming of the police in these kinds of different locations, in these different neighborhoods. That you're probably going to get over-militarization in the sense that people might send out tanks, like they did through the streets of Ferguson, Missouri, no thank you, in the aftermath of riots and protests after the death of Michael Brown. This is going to sideline the parts of the American Republicans which currently say that the over-militarization of the police is bad because of the massive expenditure. This now incentivizes the hate that comes out from the far right within America, from Trump and other advocates who will say that the executive power should be used to launch over-militarization and over-policing of these places. And note, ladies and gentlemen, that it will never be effective from BLM to be able to combat this. No, thank you. Because the technology now and the over-militarization of the police in America is asymmetric. They now have tanks. They have weapons that are too deadly for the average person to ever be able to combat. And that's incredibly damaging. The second thing to note is even in the circumstances where there isn't massive over-militarization or increased employee presence, I think that police officers are more likely to be trigger happy because much of the time, the trigger happiness comes from the fact that you are worried that someone is dangerous and from false perceptions that you have to act immediately due to the panic and short time span and oftentimes because you have little backup. Yes? How is literally any of this different from the status quo? The police are already trigger happy, the military is already shipping off tanks to any police. Uh, because things can get worse. I know things look terrible, but obviously you can have more shipping of these tanks. And especially given the fact that there is a trend within American Republicans to advocate for a decrease in this, it sidelines that portion of the American Republicans and prevents the de-escalation of that in the future. I also want to note that this is not a meaningful defense for African American people like OG posits, because African Americans who choose to do this will almost always get convicted. When they choose to shoot and when they choose to use the guns, they will be tried in the court of law that is biased against them, and they will likely have a circumstance in which they are targeted far more because of the attack that they attack police officers. In contrast, police officers will feel relatively safe still because they know that they will likely get acquitted and probably will get acquitted more often the more credibility there is to the claim that they are just defending themselves from African Americans who are holding guns on the streets. Claim number two, why is this going to lead to a targeted attack on BLM? 
I think it's important to note that the plausible outcome is not general changes in gun reform because of the massive pressure that exists from the NRA and significant lobby power, but more crackdowns on BLM in particular. This means that you might put them on the FBI hit group watch list, for instance, and given the massive intervention, no thank you, of the American executive, that means that Trump gets to decide these kinds of things. I also want to note that there's already a concerted attack against black identity extremists in the USA by the FBI, which suggests to me that this is likely to continue and become worse. What does this look like? This means that you're going to put these people on no-fly list, that you're going to likely arrest them much more, and that you're going to treat them far more terribly. These concerted attacks are not going to be things that generally affect gun control writ large, but are instead going to be a focused attack on BLM, decreasing their ability to actually function and operate, to actually get funding, and actually sell themselves as mainstream organizations that deserve to get support from donors and from politicians, and it also means that's going to become significantly more difficult for them to attract recruits when people fear the fact of the label that's going to be put on them. I'm going to take a POR from OG if you have one. So at the point where the FBI is already monitoring black extremism, how is this marginal change going to actually matter? Okay, the point is that in many of these circumstances, there are competing interests that currently exist. So, for instance, Black Lives Matter being labeled as a hate group will look unjustifiable to the vast majority of Americans right now and will be reviled by Democrats because they think that it's going to be an inaccurate representation of them. But when they literally have weapons, when they're armed and they have community controls, and when accidents occur, it's traits that political narrative which makes it much more palatable. So yes, obviously a marginal change, but it's a massive marginal change based on the perceptions of people of BLM. The last claim that I want to make is on gun violence, because as both sides acknowledge, BLM opposes widespread gun purchase and ownership for the reason that it disproportionately affects the black body. But I want to point out here that this is likely to lead to a circumstance where you A, splinter gun control, because that now means that you lose the support of Black Lives Matter in order to actually get the fight for gun control. So even if they try and create some backlash on the right, it is unlikely to be general enough, and furthermore unlikely to weigh the loss of the coalition that exists between Black Lives Matter and the Democrats to get gun control and get regulation. The second thing that I want to point out is that this is probably going to put a broader perspective that Black Lives Matter is a proxy for anti-police organizations because it seems like they no longer care about the goal of stopping black violence that occurs in the status quo between regular citizens and people who are not the state against BLM. And that means that you're going to probably get the strength and rhetoric that this is an anti-police organization rather than an organization that is trying to fight for the advancement of African Americans at large and protection of them from the state and from other people. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a noble goal, but unfortunately it's one that will be perceived terribly and lead to massive problems for BLM. Thank you. We thank that speaker very much for those remarks. This House now recognizes the Deputy Prime Minister. Hear, hear. If they're scared of retaliation under their side, of perceptions of black extremism, of accidents, they lose this debate immediately. Danny's POI doesn't fully capture the scope of this, because the perception of black rights movements being extreme occurs more when you push those who are desperate within the BLM to have that BLM fight for their rights, to then move to vigilantism, to then resort to all of these more extreme mechanisms that they want to bring to you as a counterfactual and to make that the legitimate push of what they do. At best, they have marginally more FBI monitoring. I don't really know what that marginal more looks like, but I'm willing to deal with what they gave us. They have marginally more force deployed to the police. They have mar marginally more inflamed rednecks, as if they were the stake in this debate. But they had no response to the de-escalation under our side to the salience John gives you of the low-hanging gun reform, i.e. the marginal ga gun reform of having background checks, when the majority of the crimes perpetrated are by those who aren't adequately checked in the first place for their psychological stability. This is the massive benefit we give you, to which we receive no response. No thank you. As delegate and second-rate female representation for Sophia, I'm going to do a few <laughs> How is this likely to galvanise support for the BLM for the right reasons? And note here is context that the Black Lives Matter movement has been polarised 
by either one, the internal perception of insufficiency and the lack of activism of the movement, or two, on the other side, the want to dissociate yourself from the more extreme actions that movement takes. We find the middle ground, and in so doing, as a Black Lives Matter activist, give you more scope to work with as that movement, give you more capital, give you more people who are willing to buy into that movement in the first place. A first note on new content. In brinksmanship, even if we are extremely charitable to them, and you do not mediate well as a Black Lives Matter policeman, proxy policeman, quasi-policeman, whatever you want to call them, this changes the incentives of the police actor themselves who commits that brutality. Why is that? One, white policemen under the status quo face the fear of the supposed threat of the harm from a black individual, but they don't face a legitimate fear of the threat of restitution. They don't face any fear of the prospect of culpability. So there's no countervailing fear to the fear they supposedly feel in the moment that they see that black person in the first place. In an individual situation, this means that you know that there is going to be someone from that Black Lives Matter movement who is going to try to at least mediate the situation in the first place. So your incentives to act in that instant immediately change when you have a different pressure that's placed on your calculus at that point in time. But more broadly, outside of discrete events, this looks like the white police being more likely to broker with the Black Lives Matter movement matter movement at the point at which they see them as a legitimate force who've socially organized well and one who either they're perceived by conservatives as being a threat in which case they definitely need to make sure they mitigate the supposed harm of that or two they see as a legitimate social force which they're going to be inclined to engage with them anyway this is a nuanced characterization we give you firstly they tell you that large grassroots organizations the blm is a large grassroots organization and therefore is a threat and the harm they bring from this is you're going to mil militarise police in perception of that threat. One, that occurs amidst, rightly as they say, riots and protests. The way you stifle those riots and protests from happening in the first place is by coming up with a coherent Black Lives Matter movement which achieves what black people want that movement to achieve. I.e., if we can achieve the sorts of reform that we tell you these movements are more likely to achieve, that is something that is good for these people who would otherwise protest, who would otherwise riot, and therefore beats them at the very mechanism they give us. But two, this is a large movement, there are only so much police can do to militarise, it's not as if you completely suppress the fact that you still have a mobilised movement, as they say. But three, they quite literally miss the entirety of our mechanism. We want to institute gun reform. The mechanism we use to institute that gun reform is initially embracing the fact that there are open carry laws, and that is how you galvanise governmental action. I'll take it. Closing. Yeah. You carefully select the people who are members of this organisation. Therefore, only comprehensive and extremely difficult gun reform would ever prevent them from having guns. Therefore, you make this involved at the first word of your speech. Not actually true for a few reasons. One, as we tell you, you think these actors are more likely to be moderate and therefore more likely to be trusted by both the Black Lives Matter movement internally but also externally at the point at which they aren't seen as engaging or wanting to engage in vigilantism. Their, their harm only accrues at the point at which you perceive the harms of black, lives being, uh, black people being armed as extraordinarily extreme. In that case, that, that, that has a few effects. And they laugh here because they think this is a concession. It isn't. Initially, conservatives feel threatened, but not the majority of moderates. But what happens internally within that movement is you don't try to resort to vigilante justice in the first place, because you see a coherent mechanism by which you can instantiate social reform. The second harm they bring us is that the Black Lives Matter will be more uh, movement, will be more oppressed, will be more monitored, and that is a flagrant harm. One, we tell you again on balance, they're already monitored by the FBI, they already are on no fly lists in, in many circumstances. Again, if in some circumstances there's a marginal change here, we're willing to make that concession for the fact that they didn't rebut any of our analysis on why you galvanise the NRA to protest, for example, the freedom with which you can access guns under the status quo when their conservative rhetoric now compels them to do so. Because if it's a conservative rhetoric that black people are a threat, then by that very logic, it has to be their, their, their support of the sorts of mitigation that John gives you that will actually prevail in the end. Lastly, they tell us that you splinter the movement for gun control when you embrace the movement for open carry laws. Firstly, this misses the nuance of our case. 
You embrace it as your mechanism to achieve gun control. It's not as if these are mutually exclusive aims. In fact, quite literally the entirety of John's case is telling you how these aren't mutually exclusive and are inextricably linked. I.e., either you pose a threat to conservatives, or you show how you're a moderate force within society who has the capacity to act reasonably within that Black Lives Matter movement. Both of those are conduits to proving that you can either operate well with guns, but in the end, that you want gun reform. Why is that the case? The reason you push for gun reform in the end anyway is because it's within the incentives of conservatives to push for that reform. But secondly, it's still within the incentives of the Black Lives Matter movement to eventually push for that reform because there will always be asymmetric harms leveraged against the black community. That's why we are so very proud to be here. We thank that Peter very much for those remarks. And this House now recognizes the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Here, here. I think it's important to recognise that under the status quo, the Black Lives Matter movement is having an impact. It is gradually changing the minds of many white people in America who recognise police brutality uh, for what it is and something which needs to be combated. It is taking over the Democratic Party and making police reform a meaningful part of its platform. And it is even convincing some on the right, people like the Cokes, who recognise that there is a problem with the US a prison industrial complex, that it is hugely costly, that it infringes upon people's liberties and thus must be stopped. But this motion will undo all of that promise. It will allow Black Lives Matter to um, uh, be portrayed not as a mainstream movement, which seeks uh, through non-violence and occasional non-violent civil disobedience to advance a legitimate cause. It will rather be seen as a threatening and scary uh, force which needs to be combated. That's why opening government have lost this debate. I'm going to do two things in my speech. Firstly, a few points of rebuttal, and secondly, what the likely political response will be. Let's jump straight into this, because we heard this slightly bizarre characterisation from, uh, from, the, from the Deputy Prime Minister, that there is only hostility to Black Lives Matter, or hostility to Black Lives Matter will, will get worse when white, people perceive, when white people see Black Lives Matter engaging in actions which they consider to be vigilantes. I've got a newsflash for them. This action of Black Lives Matter urging its supporters to take to the streets with guns will be perceived by most white people as extreme vigilantism. It will be perceived as a huge, uh, uh, huge threat. Not just a threat, but we think it is highly likely that even, ooh, bloody hell, that even in a couple of cases, um, things will go wrong, right? If you have people wandering around with guns, People will get shot. And Jason pointed out that given the racist nature of the US media, those instances where a police officer got shot, where a uh, member of, uh, where, where a normal civilian was shot by someone affiliated with Black Lives Matter, that will hugely tarnish uh, this movement. They say they'll train these people. I've got a newsflash, there is no amount of training that can prevent someone from lashing out, but also given that Black Lives Matter is a deeply decentralized mo movement, when Black Lives Matter say it is legitimate to carry guns around your neighborhood in order to tackle the police, some people on the fringes of that movement will, 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 will do it themselves. Ultimately, what this means is that there is going to be a huge fear of the actions that Black Lives Matter takes. What is the result of this? We have two competing suggestions. The suggestion we get from opening government is that this will make the NRA see the error of their ways. That in order to tamp down on this threat, they will start embracing gun control measures. I think what is far more plausible is the claim that Jason points out, which is that the goal of the NRA, which is not just a gun rights organisation, but also essentially a, a white supremacist organisation, will be to disarm black people from having guns. What does that look like? One, it looks like containing the impact of Black Lives Matter by massively ramping up police presence in African-American neighborhoods. It's frankly ridiculous that they dismiss all of Jason's harms as marginal, marginal, marginal. 
I'm going to note, marginally more tanks on the streets means African Americans <laughs> will die. Marginally more um, surveillance of Black Lives Matter will hinder the ability of that movement to be effective. And crucially, it knocks out the, the support which the right wing currently gives to elements of the Black Lives Matter agenda. They will instead, um, uh, uh, it, it, it instead seek to characterize Black Lives Matter as black identity extremists. It will uh, legitimize and justify even more invasive behaviors on the part of the executive. I know that this is particularly the case, as the one measure opening government wants to talk about, namely a background check, won't solve the problem of armed um, uh, uh, African American vigilantes. No, thank you. Finally, I'm going to note, uh, no, sorry, two more things. One, um, we think this is going to massively hinder the cause of gun control, because they say that Black Lives Matter can adopt this as a temporary strategy. Sure. We think that many others within the American gun control movement will regard this as an illegitimate strategy. We say many white people who support gun control and currently are in alliance with Black Lives Matter will regard this as wrong and illegitimate, that any action which in increases the number of guns on the streets will be perceived as bad. No. Two, it buys into right-wing rhetoric that individuals need to have guns in order to be protected by the, from the coercive power of the state. And three, we think it's going to turn off a large number of African Americans who are opposed uh, to this measure. It fragments the ability for us to get gun control. Finally, we hear, um, uh, we hear about police violence. We hear this bizarre thing that as a police officer, if you're in, in, a, in a standoff, and you know that there is an armed Black Lives Matter uh, person next to you, that's going to make you more restrained. Absolute nonsense. It's going to make you more afraid. I'm going to note that most police shootings are not based on cold, rational calculations. They're based on fear combined with stereotypes. When police officers have that fear, they are more likely to shoot. They are more likely to lash out. And here's the kicker. It's going to be even harder to prosecute them. Because when the police officer said, I have a reasonable fear that the guy I shot had a weapon, well, now there are large numbers of Black Lives Matter protesters who actually do have weapons and potentially have committed um, uh, uh, shooting. Closing. So, despite Malcolm X and the Black Panthers in the 1960s, that decade was the best for civil rights legislation. And it was because it was clear if you didn't listen to the demands of civil rights activists, there was a harsh alternative you had to deal with. Yeah, except that we think that the right in the US is far, far stronger than it was in the 1960s, that the, alter the, the white supremacy is far more overt within the uh, Republican uh, Party, and finally, that black, uh, the, the, uh, black Panthers, we would argue, probably hindered the ability of the civil rights movement, that what was most successful was its ability to be portrayed as moderate and successful. Let's talk then about the political response. One, I think that this is going to exacerbate white fear, that the average, the, Many white voters essentially have a choice between voting for the Democratic Party because they like its economic platform or the Republican Party because they like its cultural platform. We think this could well provide the marginal tipping point which leads many of those voters to not choose Democratic politicians. Two, I think this is going to be a tool for the, the, the white supremacist right, in that there are now going to be calls for white armed patrols to counter the danger that Black Lives Matter uh, poses. It's going to stoke up racial tensions. Three, the response from the Democratic Party will, in a large number of cases, be to distance themselves from Black Lives Matter because they know that they have to appeal to white voters. The impacts of this are the following. One, you hinder the ability to elect politicians who can institute meaningful police reform, who can help them, who can also adopt policies which benefit African Americans. But two, even when Democrats are elected, they are now less likely to implement the agenda of Black Lives Matter because they want to distance themselves from a movement which is regarded as extreme. This is a catastrophically bad idea. I'm so proud to have heard. I think I'd hear very much for those remarks, and I appreciate the Prime Minister's gesture. And uh, this House now recognizes the member of government. Here, here.
This debate is not about guns. It is not about individual police. The front half fails to recognize the role that Black Panthers play, despite the fact that they are front and center on the info slide. This debate is about people who live in houses but never homes because their space is not controlled by them. This is about communities with no community organizations, run down playgrounds that children are afraid to be in. We support taking back our communities. We support, just like the Black Panthers, having control and protection for our people, but also having things like community centers feeling comfortable uh, encouraging ourselves to have black life in these spaces. This is not scattered violence. We reject the OO case line that when they go low, we go high because we are going high. Obviously, right now, police are in our communities and they are stopping crime. So why is it low when we do it? We deserve to be able to do this, and that's what we're defending on closing government. We are tired of being told that we always have to wait because even though the OO tells us in the DLO speech that there's already change happening, that we already have the coast on our side, that completely belies the fact that the LO gives us an excellent characterization about how these communities are over-militarizing and the police continue to fail black communities. We're going to say black communities have been failed. We are not waiting for white uh, for white elites to hopefully get on our side uh, eventually. Rather, we're supporting Black Lives Matter, protecting black lives themselves. Two pieces to this extension. First, I'm going to talk about the problem of selective policing and how the characterization of over-policing is all too simple from the opening opposition. Second, I'm going to be talking to you about how we get more motivation to actually fix things in this community from the white right uh, that they talk about. Reputation will be integrated. So let's talk about selective policing. Because we don't think this debate is just about shooting cops and stopping like cops from committing police brutality, despite the fact that that's what the vast majority of the front half focused on. Because while that is a sizable and obviously very important problem, it is not necessarily the biggest thing that this motion impacts. We think that over-policing does happen. It is true that cops are too likely to stop people for drug busts and minor crimes. Remember that under-policing is a very serious problem as well, especially for the most serious yeah. crimes. It's waiting two hours when your convenience store is robbed. Remember that BLM has been asking us, why did you arrest a dealer but you did not respond to my domestic violence call? Why did you punish me for having a gun in my car but you did not investigate my brother's death? This is the type of things that actually matter in these communities because stretched out police forces are more worried about getting enough citations instead of actually solving the crimes that take more time that are scarier to solve because they do not understand and appreciate the humanity of these people in order to put their own lives on the line. Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter has done that and the fact of the matter is the civil story of over-policing is incorrect because they need to deal with the reality that black Americans in the Clinton era begged for more policing because they wanted these crimes in their communities to stop and Black Panthers was a period where we were able to have safety in these communities, which is incredibly important. This is about feeling safe. This is about actually stopping these crimes in the first place, not by shooting someone dead. It's not about like a thief running by you and you shoot him in the back while he's on his way out. It's about you being a constant presence there so you know no one's going to attack you when you go out late at night. It means that you are willing to set in the store because you know there's someone right there with a gun who is willing to protect your store, which stops anyone from robbing it in the first place. That is on our side of the house. We stop the vast majority of crime that affects people a lot, lot worse. Close it. So you are going to give like regular citizens guns and empower them to interrupt violent crimes and you're claiming it's not going to increase violence in the instances of disrupting people who also have guns? <laughs> You know, I don't know how much I like these two as people, but shout out to them for having a good model that tells us we can train these people. They very like they have a police or military background. Like it's not going to be an issue. There are sizable punishments when we do gun violence, even just at the status quo. But what is the impact of this argument? One, we get far less gun violence, especially because we decrease the number of guns in the first place. Because yes, you're giving some members of the BLM guns, but think about it. Right now, without police and without an organized force to protect you, black Americans often do get a gun because they can only protect themselves and their families their families. You turn to a gang member for help. There's now someone you can trust. There's someone that is there, which is that untrained people don't have to get a gun because there's someone in front of you who you trust who has it. This is much more important than both the front half clash in terms of like, do you get gun control? Because that's always going to be the whims of the political whims of things like the NRA, whereas on our side of the house, we stop the vast majority of people from getting guns in the first place because they don't feel that need for protection. Instead, only trained people have guns. This is an issue because recognize the types of things they focus on that is in the public eye. The idea of the rogue black American who gets a gun that's unregistered and he is going to kill you. We center in people who are trained and can protect these communities so that image is no longer tenable. 
Secondly, I want to talk about increasing the motivation to actually have ways to solve these problems. OO says, like, people are racist, you're going to over-militarize. But they fail to see the power and the will and the sheer ability of BLM that exists right now. And this also responds to the CO stuff, like, how are you going to find these people? Because the fact of the matter is, in all of our communities, in all of our systems, in all our, our classrooms, in every city, there is a ton of members of the BLM because people want to solve this problem. We understand how important it is and black Americans are not going to watch their brothers and sisters die. We are more connected than ever through things like social media that makes it incredibly easy to mobilize. But moreover, I don't think this whole problem of over-militarization is going to happen. Because you can over-militarize one city, you can over-militarize two, but there are stretched budgets. BLM is a powerful force and once they are in every major, uh, major metropolitan city, it is just not going to tell to stop it. But I don't think you're going to get all this bad press of shooting back and police acquittals in the first place. We already have shootouts where instead of a black person with a legal permit who is dressed up in a literal security vest is shooting the police cop, uh, is shooting the cop, it is someone who does not have a license. That already black class already happened, and to the extent that they're worried about white vigilantes, I think that is going to happen a lot more right now when you functionally have people who are afraid that no one is stopping crimes in these areas. But on our side of the house, when we decrease the amount of crime going on in these areas, when the statistics go down because more people in these communities look better, because more people are not committing crimes, we reduce the efforts to actually get this type of white armed patrols in these communities opening. Okay, the problem is that this function of a police force probably isn't large enough to cover the amount of communities you want to, it's a large enough impact at best, and can be done without guns. You haven't told us why guns are the exclusive thing, but in our stance, we're happy with community patrols without guns. Like, your smart people look at you and peacekeepers who have no ability to actually use the guns that they have, the OO model of mediators who are not able to do anything because they are not trained and they're not actually able to apprehend a crime is exactly why someone will openly and flagrantly commit a crime right in front of them. That is not a solution, and even if we don't immediately have all the police people we need, we're capable of training them over time. Look, I want to talk about how this actually is better politically because it means that you create a space where the radical left uh, goes much further to the left, and now you're forced to do things like implement solutions to, in these communities because you cannot stop them directly. You have to give them more money for their hospitals. You have to give them better policing in the first place because there's no other way that you're going to get rid of these scary black people with guns. Moreover, even if you don't negotiate with the uh, with uh, the BLM, you're, more, you're much more likely to do things like engage with the M uh, NAACP. Because remember our POI, that the Black Panthers, is part of what forced whites to engage with MLK because you shift the window to the left when it's like, well, if we can't deal with all these people with guns, we need some solutions, so we'll engage with the NAACP and we'll find out what these communities need. We're happy to create a space where black communities can flourish, where they're capable of developing politicians and having good schools and feeling like they themselves are safe. That's when you decrease the need for gun violence in the first place, but that's also what actually causes a change in political opinions. We stand by controlling communities. We thank that speaker very much for those remarks. This House now recognizes the member of the opposition. Here, here. Do not be fooled by the rhetoric of closing government, which tries to sell you the same lie that right-wing groups like the NRA sell black people across America, and that is the only way for them to be more treated positively in society, to them, themselves, to take up arms and to push back against the state. The core message of the Black Lives Matter movement is one of non-violence, and that's important because in this debate, no team has had the important contribution which we uniquely add, which is how the movement itself responds and how the conduct and leadership within it changes. So with that said, our first problem of extension is on that, on the group dynamics within the Black Lives Movement. Yep. I think that those movements are largely going to be fragmented. This gets five seconds of treatment in a kit, but that is insufficient, because they do not provide the structural reasons why black people won't buy into it writ large. The reason for that is, first of all, that guns throughout history have been the vessel for enacting harm against the black body and black bodies throughout America, and secondly, because of the roots of the movement in black liberation and Christian theology, which is necessarily rooted in anti-violence and anti-guns. That's important, obviously, in the sense to which that is largely mutually exclusive. If you have two fragmented groups, intuitively, at some stage, that's likely to be less able to get the positive change on society, which also engages with CG's extension. But importantly, note how this changes the way that membership acts 
protests are crowded out as a mechanism. That's important because protests have proven efficacy because we need a critical mass of people to protest, and at that point the state must concede to your demands. But now, firstly, all protests are perceived to be violent because there will be people within that who carry weaponry. But secondly, it creates a higher barrier entry for you to join a protest because now you're not just joining a peaceful protest, you're putting your body on the line in a way in which the state is likely to respond with funds. So, secondly, why Black Lives Matter is probably members within that are likely to use weaponry and not just use it as a bulwark against the state. Opening half problems about training here, but misses the most important mechanism. That mechanism is the unique sensation and psychology that you get when you carry a firearm. Look at the suicide rates that open government refers to. That's to say that people buy a gun with the presupposition that they'll use it to protect their family, but they end up using it them on themselves. And that is an absolute tragedy. The reasons for that are probably because you have some sense of path dependency, some sense of sunk cost fallacy, some sense to which you over-rationalise and over-justify the use of your gun. Importantly, you don't need every black person who gets a gun under your government team model to shoot people. You just need a select few. And once that happens, all of the backlash and crackdown, which opening opposition slightly touched on, occurs. Both government teams here assume uh, that, that uh, fail because they assume that the way in which gun violence happens is something akin to mutually assured destruction with nuclear weapons. But they ignore that there is a distinct human element that occurs on the ground and in the moment, with all the foibles of fears and biases that occur of people and do not occur at a macro scale. But opening opposition misses the empirics because training makes it more likely. Cops are trained. Look at the rates in which they shoot black people on the street. Look at the way in which they shoot black silhouettes in training simulations as opposed to people who are white. So, with that said, changing the way in which people act would provide the most strongest mechanisms in this debate. Now I want to talk about the leadership of this movement and why that changes. Mechanistic reasons. Firstly, if you are a moderate person now, currently exists within the Black Lives Matter movement, by definition you must give up a leadership position within that movement. That's to say that obviously it is antithetical to a Black Lives Movement which is pro-open carry to have somebody who is anti-open carry leading that movement. But secondly, note that those who are most likely to rise are those who are proven their credentials under the status quo, a status quo where that wasn't the position of the Black Lives Movement, and therefore they're likely to abuse violence in a non-strategic way, and their poor judgment is now enshrined at the top of that movement, the way in which that movement goes forward. But thirdly, I think you exclude a lot of women from that movement, and that's problematic at the point in which the movement was largely founded by powerful women of colour. That's a movement which is representational on the way in which CG wants to say they get all of those benefits that they get. But also, women are probably more likely to care about the, uh, the harms that are enacted to families and to women within black communities, and that's why it's, not, it's important to not ostracise them. So, before I go on to my second extension about the mechanisms of inducing crackdown, I'll take the PLI thing and go on. Yeah, okay. So, you say that using the, the mantle of nonviolence, conservatives already associate Black Lives Matter with the Dallas shooter hurting them. Conservatives are already afraid of Black Lives Matter. We should use that fear for a good end of promoting gun reform. Liberals yeah, okay, okay. okay. You're, you're trying to watch this. Obviously, you can be afraid of something and then be more afraid of it when they're more likely to carry guns. I think that's intuitive logic. Second extension on mechanisms of inducing crackdown. I want to briefly touch on the narrative material which was lightly touched on in the opening half. Opening half recognises that the state now has a democratic mandate to over police, but they ignore the impact, and the closing government does too, because the impact there is that you're more likely to police these communities for lower level crimes. So, for example, you're more likely to go into a particular area and punish people within it for drug crimes, which obviously has problems when it intersects with things like mandatory minimums or other laws which are applied racially and in a discriminatory fashion. That has a greater scale to all the benefits claimed by teams in this debate, and that is a unique contribution that we give. Obviously, there are racist tropes which play out, and there are middle class fears which are played on as opening uh, identifies, but importantly, it now justifies a narrative where you can shoot someone who carries a gun. So if racists see somebody as a scary black person, they will shoot. And the the fact that they have a badge saying that they are a peaceful member carrying a gun probably won't stop them. But it's not just cops, everybody. It is also vigilantes. Look at the way in which people who are akin to George Zimmerman are likely to act under their policy. They're more likely to act in an emboldened fashion and to enact gun violence. But they're strategic in it, which engages with the budget material the closing government gives you, because they're more likely to use it where the power gap between black and white communities is at its largest. Where you have a gated community, next to a ghetto, for example. That's to say that they talked about open carry laws. The point is that doesn't just apply to you, that applies to other people as well. Opening opposition's final push here, uh, final claim here is that uh, they will be acquitted, but it's, the point there is that it's uncomparative in the sense that they're more likely to do it, because now they have the legal excuse of self-defense. Closing. Look, even if there are these armed officers with guns in the community, if there's less crime in these communities in the first place, they look better, they're flourishing with life, why would there be a fear of violence coming from? Yeah, because that's not a POI that pushes your case forward, that is a 
POI which reasserts the assertions that you have already given about the way in which those communities change. We've given you mechanistic and structural reasons to say that those communities are ones which are more likely to be over-policed and more likely to have violence. That is violence which will be enacted asymmetrically on people of colour, and that's why this motion fails. The final point I want to add is that of the media. I think opening opposition again identifies this, but misses the most important point about the way in which the media operates in the United States, which is that it operates in a highly segmented fashion. So, for example, it's not that telling the way in which MSNBC may report this, but it's more important the way in which Fox News may report this. That means the government's benefits are obfuscated by this point alone and that they are unlikely to get them. At the conclusion of this speech, I just want to note two things. Firstly, if over-policing is a wash, the unique delta that we provide during this debate is the way that groups and individuals act and the leadership structures which are likely to be created. But secondly, I want to note importantly, the narrative that, for example, was created after Sandy Hook. That's a narrative which says that teachers should have guns, and that was the problem. When you add more guns into the mix, it's a necessary consequence that you get more gun violence. All of the government's benefits could not be more spurious and could not be more debatable. I thank that speaker very much for those remarks, and we are now pleased to welcome the government whip. What the opposition teams needed in this debate was comparative. A comparative that addressed the harms black communities face on a daily basis. A comparative that was more sufficient than the Koch brothers and moderate change and opening opposition. And this weird notion of a movement without explaining what it was or what it was actually doing to help people on closing opposition. Three things in the speech. First, talking about the movement that closing opposition presents in their extension. Secondly, what we do to actually help communities, both creating tangible incentives for the state to change, but also why we help when the state is likely to fail anyways. And lastly, dealing with the Michelle Obama opening up of like, go, go I. Um, okay, so, closing opposition, fragmenting the movement. We're just gonna take a stance, this is good. It is good to have a diverse movement with diverse political ideologies all reaching towards the same state of affairs. In the civil rights movement, you had that, with the SCLC as a religious movement aiming towards marches, the NAACP pursuing legal change in the courts, SNCC, which organized around students, and yes, the Black Panthers. The reason that was good is because people have differing ideological conceptions of the best way for changes. And this is true of Black Lives Matter and the status quo even without this. Like, a lot of black people don't necessarily agree with the way Black Lives Matter pursues change. We would say right now on our side of the house what you get is a coalition that includes multiple people and pursues multiple types of change. Things like Al Sharpton's movement, the NAACP, Obama, and, and, and yes, a black movement that's based on armed community control and community patrol taking control. Um, that was a lot of um, so we, we, we get that. The reason that's good is first you get more grassroots buy-in, which was the objection they had, because there are many different ways you can get engaged in change if you actually want it. The second thing is that you better and bolster the claims of civil rights activists, because you know if you don't listen to the general problems that Black Panthers are responding to, you need to bolster the other people you want them to behave. I think every team in this debate has accepted, like, the police probably don't want these community patrollers walking around with guns. They probably don't like it. The way you do that is you show there is hope in things like peaceful protests. You show that we will listen to your demands if you actually listen to them. You delegitimize the Black Lives Matter movement by showing there is a more successful alternative you can pursue. That happens on our side of the house where we structurally give the state to finally listen to these communities. That is comparatively better. The last thing is just you need different types of actions to ensure this, that people can't pursue peaceful protests if they're always worried about being shot by the police or about crime in their communities so that they can't engage in political activism. To the extent we decrease that with this facet of the movement, there are other facets of the movement that can act. But then the next thing they say is all the stuff about there's a human element in this, that people are going to mistakes, that the training won't be sufficient. The first thing is that recognize this is likely to happen in the status quo already. There are already people who kill cops. There are already people who engage in violence. There are already gang members who have access to guns. We think you are structurally likely by giving people an outlet where they can be trained, where these people also understand the uh, destruction gun violence has in their community and are probably likelier to think twice about using a gun than an average police officer with no connection to the community, that you are likely to have at least some improvement in people's lives, at least compared to what is going to happen on their side of the house where this violence happens anyway. 
The second thing is that this is not just people walking around with guns with no accountability. It is part of a community organization outside of the state. If you think someone is going to shoot recklessly, your community patrol organization would say, maybe don't give a gun to that person, give it to the person who pursues training. We think that that is the type of self-control and grassroots activized that activism that was the legacy of the Black Panther movement that you can still get on our side of the house. Lastly, they say, like, women can't participate in this. Like, I think women can shoot a gun perfectly fine. Yeah. Uh, as, yeah. Um, I'll take okay. okay. The reason why the Overton window won't change in this circumstance is now that the state can swamp them with surveillance, militarization, and the use of social media to catch the worst cases of this, this will turn the public will against them and lead to them being suppressed rather than actually able to change political dialogue. The state's end goal is that there are fewer people participating in these organizations. People will join these organizations because they are being over-policed and they don't think the state is doing that. Eventually, the state will catch on to the idea that these tanks are not actually reducing this activism, not making people feel safe, and that a different approach is needed. And to some extent, you see marginal forms of this in the status quo, with more activism around things like community policing and things like actually building those networks. We think you get much more of that on our side of the house, where you raise the stakes a lot more as well. What did we bring to you in extension? The first thing was that you actually do get the state to listen to you because the material I gave you that there's a tangible incentive to respond. The second thing is this debate isn't, doesn't have to be about killing cops. I think most people realize it's probably a bad idea, and instead it is about the safety benefits you get. What do we get to that? There's a closing off POI that there, there's going to be more violence. We say that's not necessarily true because the main way this works is through actual deterrence, that people know someone is walking around so you're not likely to do the things you otherwise get away with behind closed doors because you don't think the cops are going to come to try to hold you accountable. The second thing is that the alternative people turn to when they need protection and aren't getting it is gays. That is the source of a lot of com uh, crime in communities like the south side of Chicago. We help deconstruct that by creating a positive force that actually productively trains people for safety in a way that is much more accountable and actually protects these people. OG also says, like, well, how, how are you actually going to, you're not going to have enough people to join this. We say that's not true. This would be a wide-scale uh, community policing organization across the country. Um, the reason the speeds are opening up is that they focus on things like uh, deterring police brutality and gun reform, all based on the idea that the state is going to provide change. Our thesis is the likeliest thing that is like uh, that is going to create change is taking matter into your own hands because the state has historically been slow. I agree, like gun control is marginally likelier on opening gov because opening opposition doesn't give you any structural reason why the natural filibuster that exists in the Senate through right. all the rural states that are represented and changes on their side of the house. But still, like relatively unlikely versus the fact that once you go out in your community and try to take control, try to monitor the crimes that actually happen, you create a quality of life improvement in average people. Because they're able to do things like go to the playground, go to church, engage in political mobilizing without feeling unsafe on their streets. That is a huge benefit that we don't need the state to provide. Opening opposition. They say things get worse. Like, I, I, I don't think the scales linear, linearly. Like, if a police department already has one tank, it's unclear what, like, a tank right behind it does besides, like, have a little bit more fear. And, and they say, like, there's retaliation. But we say this doesn't have to be an oppositional relationship. That when you create a force in the community that is designed towards providing safety and cooperating to the extent possible, you are likelier to get change than when you just have no engagement with the police whatsoever because all, the only time you interact with them is when they're arresting you for minor crimes. They say Black Lives Matter is working in the status quo. I just don't think that's true. Like, Donald Trump is president. Like, Republicans won a bunch of governorships when black candidates were running. We say that even if there is a slow pace of change, fine. When that change happens, these community control groups become less, uh, less popular. But until that happens, take matters into your own hands to improve the conditions around you. Proud to propose. <laughs> We thank that speaker very much for those remarks. This House now recognizes the final speaker of the debate, the opposition whip. Political change is extraordinarily difficult to achieve. It is impossible to raise taxes and justify that to fund the kind of schemes that CG talks about. And the NRA shapes all of the policies that exist and open in government to mean that you always want to support laxer gun laws and they can never actually get it past their constituency to defy their key premise, which is obviously opening up access to guns. That is why our extension was so important and was deeply, deeply under-responded to. So what we're actually saying right, is that 
The leadership and membership of this movement is shaped by a profound and clear commitment to non-violence. The leaders who are queer women of colour are committed to saying we should never use violence in these cases. This policy is literally oppositional to every core principle of the current leadership of that organisation. We told you these people are likely to resign at the point at which this policy fiats these organisations must be led to support open carry laws and use guns. The consequence we give you was the kind of people that would fill that particular void were individuals who had a long-standing commitment to the use of violence and guns in these instances. And that was so important, because what it told you, and the way we extend beyond opening opposition and win this debate, is that the people who now control and operate this movement are structurally more likely to use violence, not only in these instances, but more generally. Because Stuart explains to you, that firstly, when you have a gun in your hand, your psychology changes in a way that means you're likely to, more likely to use violence even when we otherwise didn't think it was rational. But secondly, the people that lead these organisations are people who believe that violence is actually now the best alternative, something conceded by closing government when they say you open a political landscape for other modern organisations. And that is the point. We prove to you these people are more likely to use violence in all instances and are more likely to use violence in the specific instances of this policy. That is so devastating, because I've already watched you any political outcomes that can occur, insofar as no team proved to sufficiency why the increase or decrease of political capital would be enough to change these hard-set laws that would exist. But we proved mechanistically why there are many more deaths and killings than opening opposition and therefore take this motion. So, what does closing government respond to with this? Their key push, right, is to argue the biggest issue is under-policing and we rectify that particular problem. The problem with that is firstly what I asked in the point of information, which is to say that as my ext the extension delivers, they're likely to do this incorrectly or apply it in a way that's particularly malicious, even if they are trained. As Stuart told you, you are still more likely to shoot insofar as you see as a particular threat, particularly when you're engaging with gangs who obviously have many guns and are likely to be an imminent threat on your person. You're often trained to shoot when you intervene in these circumstances. Let's do a bit of a narrative analysis. If you have these vigilante individuals entering these areas and deciding to use violence against gangs and having death and murder, the political coverage is likely to mandate that you reallocate police, which is way easier to do than change budgets or policy because you require executive power within a particular police force. That is so pivotal because opening government and all sides explain to you why over-policing is terrible and still gives you particular mechanisms. Because selective policing and no policing is actually better than policing in some form. Because in the states where you have no policing, you're going to have the most racist cops because they literally didn't send anyone there in the first place. You're going to have the individuals that are most likely to pull the trigger. The individuals who are most likely to then capture you and put you in prison. Because the best case scenario is preventing some deaths. The point is you put gang, violent mem gang members in prison who are now radicalised in that prison cell who have no other alternative but gang violence and then resort to that gang violence again. So all that left all meant that the closing government was likely to increase that. The next thing they argue is that there's a motivation to now solve the problem because there's a space for the radical left but also you're going to fund a bunch of money rather than sending police officers to a, or a group that you fear as opening government already told you. But here's the key push, right? The mechanism that's missing is first of all, obviously Black Lives Matter has the institutional capacity and power. So this policy is what Stuart talked about, which is, you know, the, uh, the Batman syndrome. You're creating a problem to solve it to the extent that what you're doing is you're reducing the political capital of an existing, you know, like positive movement, which is non-violent, to create another positive movement that's non-violent to counteract with it. But the problem which is really bad there is that obviously it's going to be a lot of skepticism if OG's characterization is true, which is these people are seen as threatening. So all individuals are seen as supporting this kind of movement violently, especially in this supporting Black Lives Matter, especially those organisations coalesce on certain policies. So finally in these clashes, I'm now going to do open in government, because I think that it interacts with a lot of material closing and shows why it's also relevant, and shows why our mechanistic analysis regarding violence is the most important in the debate, but firstly, yes. The comparative in this debate is not non-violence. We told you lots of people already have problems with the status quo of Black Lives Matter movement, and there are lots of other things they can do. That doesn't change there's a real need for safety in these communities that they will pursue in a more destructive fashion if you don't embrace our problems. That's, that would be a brilliant extension. But there's literally no analysis underlying why that will occur, right? We've explained to you intervention is necessarily harmful. You've not explained how that will manifest. Our argument is that that's quote, that's intuitively more appealing insofar as we've got a lot of progressive action from nonviolent protest in the first place. That was a silly clear way. Okay, the first thing opening government gives you is this real Hail Mary political reform argument. And they argue there is tenuous low-hanging fruit. 
I already beat this in a POI when I said obviously they fit out in that these individuals are trained and tested and scrutinised, so you can't have the kind of low hanging laws preclude them from getting guns. It's actually actively worse for your side, because now you're saying that these threatening people have guns unless you tackle the entire gun problem and ban guns altogether, because they would pass all the low hanging thresholds of screening and all those kind of things. So what that therefore means is you actually make it actively worse and more powerful for the NRA to use the kind of rhetoric they did post Sandy Hook to say you need guns to combat the guns because the alternative is no guns at all because their policy fits that out. Yes. So members of the community police organizations will be qualified and will pass the background checks. It's the racist perceptions of NRA voters that makes them think they won't pass those background checks. Um, no, obviously the NRA would weaponize the arguments that these people have guns, you give them way too much credit for the NRA, who's already so sceptical of Black Lives Matter in the first place, like real Hey Larry once again. So, I'm going to deal now with their decreasing political violence thing. Their final push is that like, you don't have the fear of violence, but obviously the point, right, is that you don't rationally think that individual has a gun. But also, if they have a gun, it's not that, you know, I better not shoot because they have a gun, they'll shoot back. It's, they could shoot me, so I'll preemptively shoot them, that is a mechanism opening opposition didn't give and you will credit us for, because obviously that's why it's preemptive, and that's why our psychological analysis actually stands, because you fear people shooting you even if that actually doesn't occur. But the second point, right, say you mediate, you monitor, etc., etc., but you give them guns, so obviously the stakes in the escalation are far higher. Look, Speaker, we give the most compelling analysis. Individuals who have a predilection towards violence are the ones that now run these organisations. Psychologically, you are wired towards using this violence in any situation. No policy reform happens because no one did anything beyond glib analysis the way American politics works. We show why people die. That sounds like a pretty big impact to me. It's a broad scale. We oppose the motion. Thank you again all for having one more round of applause for the debaters. <laughs> 